So, for the few of you who don't know me, I'm Brian Flay. I'm a professor at Health Promotion Health Behavior. And it's my pleasure today to uh, introduce our speaker, Andy Johnson. We've known each other for 35 years. We're, we're, we're 39. <laughs> Since far away. Yes, we met in 1979, right? Right. At a conference in Berlin, at which he told me that he was moving from Minnesota to the University of Southern California, and I said, wow, lucky you. <laughs> a few months later, he calls me up and recruits me to go to Southern California with him. Can I, can I correct that? Actually, you were on a recruitment visit to Minnesota. I was. And yes. I grabbed you during the visit and took you to lunch. Stole me. <laughs> stole me. Stole me from yeah. uh, what would have been a horrible life. <laughs> That's right. So I'm forever grateful that he was good to me to Southern California. So anyway, he, he uh, and, and uh, President Reagan became the president shortly after that. And um, we, so we were... And, and they decreased the NIH budget. He decreased the NIH budget. So we were going crazy writing grants, thinking that it was going to be so much more competitive. And we wrote a bunch of grants and got most of them funded. So then we were like crazy for the next few years, right? But that's what started us off doing uh, a lot of interesting work in smoking prevention and drug abuse prevention. And then I got recruited to Illinois, and we both continued on our paths. Um, and, and our paths hardly ever crossed, so it's great for our paths to cross again here. <laughs> he uh, uh, built this big uh, research center at the University of Southern California, and then uh, uh, 2000, when did he move to Claremont? 2008. 2008, he moved uh, out to Claremont Graduate School to uh, start a program there and uh, was the founding dean of a school there. And, uh, and has recently gotten into translational research in, in the broader community, and that's what he's going to talk about with us today. Thank you for coming in. I am. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> um, a little payback, a story about Brian. When um, <laughs> I brought him out for the visit to USC and introduced him to my dean, they had uh, probably 30 or 45 minutes together. John Biles, I don't know if you remember this. And after Brian had left, uh, John came to me and said, uh, you sure you want to bring this guy in? He's going to make waves. And, uh, and I said, yes, I do, and, I, and I'm going to ride those waves. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, and it was on, on Brian's waves and, and that of other, uh, some excellent recruits uh, that we did uh, that my the stages of my career that Brian talked about took off. So yeah, we've, although we haven't worked together uh, directly in quite some time, I continue to be influenced by, by Brian in very, very positive ways. I'm going to talk today about uh, an undertaking that we have begun in, in uh, translational research and to formalize mechanisms. Uh, for translational mechanisms, uh, mecha uh, translate, translational programs. Um, tr uh, translational research that is uh, interdisciplinary, uh, involves team science. Uh, I've been involved in so-called transdisciplinary research for a few years, enjoyed a couple of NIH-funded uh, centers in that uh, area, um, crossing various um, fields of research from initially from cultural studies to social psychology to communications and then uh, in the second round uh, genetics to um, uh, prevention. I'm not going to talk about that, uh, but uh, I, I'm very much a transdisciplinary and a team scientist. Uh, I, uh, I thrive on working with other people and, and uh, that's what community translational research has to be about. The, some of the ideas I'm going to talk about today have been percolating for, well, uh, for several years, certainly since I got to Claremont. went to Claremont in 1980, and um, Claremont is a very small community. Um, 
It's, uh, I don't know if you know the Claremont Colleges, it's, it's five uh, distinguished undergraduate colleges and uh, two graduate institutions, uh, one that's been around since the 1920s, I think, uh, the one that uh, my school's located in, and um, uh, a newer uh, technology, uh, the Keck Graduate Institute, a biotech, uh, small biotech school. Uh, but there was no uh, history of health sciences uh, really there other than Keck from the standpoint of uh, more technical uh, kinds of things that we do. And so it was apparent to me that we needed to develop forge relationships with others in the community. Uh, we needed to forge a relationship with a medical school. Uh, at USC, we were with the Keck School of Medicine. We needed to form a relationship with uh, people in the community because much of my work uh, and our work together, Brian and me, was community-based uh, research. And it was fundamental, uh, especially as, as we began to learn how to do community-based participatory research, that one involved communities from the very beginning. So I wanted to do this. But the tide was going the other way when I arrived there. It's like, you know, the old sailing ships, you don't set out to sea when the tide is coming <coughs> in because you're, you're going to have to pedal and you can't make it. Uh, so uh, these ideas kind of percolated in my head for a while. Uh, and uh, now, just in the last uh, 12 to 18 months, the tide has changed very rapidly uh, in ways that I'll describe. And uh, we've, we had the opportunity to create something that I think is unique. At least I don't know about anything quite like this. Uh, if you do, I'd love to hear about it. Or if you know uh, any permutations on this, I'd like to hear about it. But it's a formal partnership between two academic institutions and two uh, public uh, health institutions uh, to do translational research to really affect uh, the politics, uh, the practice of, of health especially in community-based health, uh, and uh, to, to relate to the research that's generated in the university and have a flow back and forth. So that's uh, my brief introduction. Uh, I'm going to talk, uh, I'm going to give you a brief description of the Institute, what we're calling Community Translational Research Institute. I'm going to talk about the region that served the so-called Inland Empire. Uh, anybody know what the, has anybody ever heard the term Inland Empire? Any Southern County, you know, Southern, do you know what counties are involved? Um, I think so. <laughs> I don't know. Is it like, um, well, I mean, you know? Exactly. Riverside, San Bernardino. Some people will include the far east over the hills, eastern corner of, of LA County. Uh, but generally, it's Riverside and, and, and uh, San Bernardino. I'm going to talk, tell you a bit about them. Uh, talk a little bit about what I say translation, translational research, what I'm talking about. Um, and uh, then something about the technology or what we know that might be now transportable uh, to uh, uh, translational activities. Uh, then describe our, the first project that the Institute is carrying out, something called REFER, which is Diabetes Free Riverside and uh, a little bit about next steps. Well, the Center for Translational Research is a consortium. Uh, it uh, is a consortium of uh, four institutions, and this is how it happened. Uh, the man on the left, is, is na his name is Brad Gilbert. He's the CEO of something called Inland Empire Health Plan. That is the major insurer of Medicaid patients and many of the Medicare patients for San Bernardino and uh, Riverside counties. It was created by the, the counties for that purpose. He's the CEO of that organization. I sought him out when I, when I was dean and, and said, um, you know, maybe we could form a partnership. Uh, we'd like to do some things in the community uh, around uh, maybe diabetes prevention. He said, if you can bring us something that, that uh, has a good chance of working, especially if you can uh, show that it's having some impact, I can divert uh, monies to support that uh, in community -based, for community-based prevention programming. So that was a significant step. Uh, then uh, Jay Orr, who's the uh, man in the bottom right, who is the CEO of Riverside County, came to me 
and said, we've got, now, don't go back to Riverside County public health people saying this. He said, but I think we've got a mess in public health. He said, I think we're not doing 21st century public health. This guy's an attorney, and, and uh, uh, but tremendous vision. Uh, he's a real visionary. He said, we ought to be out there doing community-based interventions. <laughs> So I told him about some of the things that I'm going to talk about today, particularly the North Karelia project as an example of how a community-based uh, program can really have an impact on chronic disease. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll give you $100,000 and go do something. And he said, whatever you want to do. So we came up with the idea for Project Defer. Uh, and uh, then I pulled out of my closet, this uh, institute idea that had, uh, the tide had been pushing against it for, for some time. And I said, why don't we create a permanent structure that involves key uh, elements of the community to do that? So he took that to the Board of Supervisors for the Riverside County, and they came up with money to, to start it. Uh, before that, we, before they did, we had uh, uh, identified our partners, and I'll talk about that. Um, this is uh, not uh, news to any of you in public health, but we know that the majority of mortality in this country now, and these are, these are actually Riverside data, these are Riverside County data. 63% of the deaths in, in Riverside County are the result of heart disease, stroke, cancer, respiratory conditions, and diabetes, uh, which are driven by poor nutrition, lack of physical activity. Uh, and tobacco use, of course. So this is this is the number for Riverside County. The Riverside uh, Medical System, they have a hospital, regional medical center, and they have 10 clinics. They're losing $50 million a year right now in that uh, system. And that is a big <coughs> part of what motivates Jay and the Board of Supervisors uh, to do something. So why not try prevention? Well, uh, these are data uh, from the Commonwealth Fund uh, we spend uh, nationally, uh, no, 10%, uh, when one considers the impact of various factors on health outcomes, about 10% can be attributable to access to health care. That's a very important 10%, but it's 10%. 20% to genetics, 70% to environments and behavior. This is the national expenditures. We spend 4% on prevention and we spend 96% on medical services. That formula is killing Riverside County and it's killing uh, the country as well as killing individual people. Uh, and uh, so that, that's a motivating factor for, for, the, for the supervisors to get behind the plan. Well, the mission of, of the uh, Community Translational Research Institute is to carry out translational research that justifies for the supervisors and for others, uh, for IHP and others, the shifting of, health care, of the health care dollar more to community-based <coughs> prevention. Let's see if we can at least double that 4%, get it to 8% or 10%, something like that. Preferably more, but I think that's, that's, that's uh, an objective. 8 to 10% is something that Brad Gilbert will talk about at IEHP. Thinks it's a realistic goal. And to demonstrate the effectiveness of improving health outcomes and doing so cost effectively, reducing the expenditures. As I think about the translational sequence, what is in the blue is what the Institute is involved in. We're not doing basic prevention science, uh, we're not doing basic communications research. Uh, we're not doing basic e-health research. We do that in the university. Uh, you do that. Um, others like us uh, do that. But what we do is take what we learn uh, from basic prevention science. And right now, with the first stage we're carrying out, uh, DEFER as an example of it, it's a feasibility and demonstration project to say, can we take this up, some of this that Brian and others have shown us uh, can work in, in uh, uh, efficacy trials. Can we implement that in a community, get, get it to take in the community, and produce similar kinds of results, and, and when, is there, when does it fail? 
And then from what we learned from that, to do new randomized trials involved uh, in the community, from that to impact program and policy, <coughs> and then from what we learn, what works and doesn't work, to take it back to basic research in, in the universities, the academic centers that are collaborating with us. So that's that's what that's the way I think about the translational sequence as we're engaged in it, and our activity is here. What does that boil down to you for you know when you're hassling with people on directs and who gets the grants and who gets the indirects? Any research that's in this realm, the institute gets, the universities get that. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's kind of the academic politics of it. And we actually reached agreement on that. But it was really necessary because if, if we were not, if we did not create a neutral playing field for all of the institutions to play, then, then we're not going to get the kind of engagement in this that we would want. So very important. So these are the, these are the primary participants. There are four institutions. There's a, there's a, school, there's a community and global health, which is our public health. We have public health, the MPH there, PhD. We also have a prevention neurosciences program there. Um, and uh, so the School of Community and Global Health is, is a CGU's agent. Um, IEHP, I mentioned, this is the insurer. And they, uh, the, they run billions of dollars through there to cover uh, more, more than a million subscribers now in the system. Uh, University of uh, California, Riverside is a new medical school. Their first four-year class entered last fall. Their second-year class is entering uh, in the fall. They are unique as a medical school in California, the California system, and that they're community-oriented. They made a deal with the other medical schools uh, and the legislature that they were going to teach uh, community-oriented physicians. And so it's about preventive medicine, primary care medicine. So they make wonderful partners. They're not going to do a school of public health. Uh, so, so CGU becomes a part, has become a partner with UCR from, from that standpoint. And the county of Riverside. And I'll say more about <coughs> Then at, this is, this is the group that begins it. And, I, and uh, later on in my talk, I'll, I'll, uh, t I'll, describe the commitments that each of these partners has made. Each of the institutions has a um, member a representative on the board of directors, and the fifth member of the board of directors is the CEO. That's me. <laughs> then there are other institutions that it's important to, to bring into play, uh, because uh, the community uh, if we're really going to have impact in the community, uh, we've got to uh, involve the cities. Uh, there are something like, I think, 28 uh, separate cities, incorporated cities or towns in the two counties. Uh, colleges, other colleges in the community, and this is just three of them. Uh, Laverne, Loma Linda, uh, four of them. Uh, California Baptist, uh, the community colleges. Um, Community-based organizations, uh, community centers, clinics. The county has 10 clinics, and, and we they are participating, <coughs> but we want the private clinics as well. Uh, to, it'll be totally on a voluntary basis, but I've met with the uh, Riverside County Medical Association, and they, they're embracing uh, this, uh, and, and the various hospitals in, in, in the region. So that is, those are the members um, that's roughly how, how we're uh, organized as an institute. Before I go on to the next thing, any, any comments or questions from you about, about the institute? Or generally what we're trying to do? I'm just curious, because I'm a dean, so I need to know how much did it start it? 
I mean, you're talking about the funding coming in. And I know later on always uh, grants and so on. Right. You mentioned about uh, the insurance company, also the county. Yes. So give you started, how much does that take? Uh, I'll, I'll uh, uh, give you advance uh, something, something I was going to show you there at the end, but I'll tell you. Okay. Now, I'll tell you now, it's the county of Rivers, the Board of Supervis Supervisors initially said, okay, here's $100,000. Uh, when they actually took it, and voted on it, they upped it to three hundred thousand. Okay, so that was three hundred thousand. They've recently given me another thirty thousand to to do the screening that some of the screening that we're doing in in one town called Harupa Valley to do it in another one as well. So that's three thirty. They've pledged, uh, or they've given me another hundred fifty thousand to hire a PhD researcher who will then have a faculty appointment at CGU, and pending is another hundred fifty thousand for that. Pending as well is another uh, 200, roughly 200,000 from the county. So we're up above 600,000 right now that I feel pretty good about. And IEHP has pledged uh, or has given $50,000 for infrastructure to start to hire an assistant. Um, and as soon as we show them uh, feasibility from the trial we're doing, they're going to fund, uh, if, if it proves feasible and we're getting uh, what we expect, uh, doesn't mean health outcomes, but we're able to implement it, uh, they're, going, they're going to uh, fund dissemination of this diabetes prevention program and then to build for it. They really uh, want to shift more of what of their expenditures to prevention if we can show them that we're getting, getting some, fact, so, some effects. So we're a little over six hundred thousand dollars right now. That's that's the startup. And yes, we're going. To, we're meeting uh, with the um, California Endowment. They're interested uh, in supporting it. We're meeting with Robert Wood Johnson. They're they're interested. One of uh, our adjunct faculty, you may know, in Alonzo Plow, uh, is now uh, vice president and director of research for Robert Wood Johnson. And some of the ideas here actually were ideas that he contributed to before he went out there. Well, let me say something about the uh, region uh, that we're. How much time do we have, by the way? Until one. Until one. Okay, good. This is the region we serve. This is California. Um, in the southeastern part of the state are two counties, San Bernardino, which in land mass, uh, I think they claim is the largest county in the country. Uh, and uh, Riverside County. Riverside County is about the size uh, of New Jersey, uh, the two together about the size of the state of West Virginia. Um, if this were, if this Inland Empire, these two counties were uh, a state, it would be the 26th uh, largest state in the country, uh, just ahead of Kentucky, Oregon, and others. So it's a very large population uh, that we're serving. Uh, these are some of the cities, uh, larger cities uh, in, in uh, the two counties. Point of the slide is, is two. One, the population is growing very rapid. It's one of the fastest growing regions of California. Growing very rapid, you see from 2000 uh, projected out to uh, 2060. Uh, you see the increasing percentage Hispanic. That's about 46, 47 percent Hispanic right now in Riverside County. Uh, in the region as a whole, in an empire, uh, the Hispanics are the majority population. Uh, they're Mexican Americans largely, uh, uh, suffering from uh, the, the kinds of health uh, uh, disparities that. Uh, poor immigrant populations suffer from, and, and, and you're familiar with those. These are similar data for San Bernardino County. Together, it's a population of 4.4 million, uh, covering an area of 27,000 square miles. It's a huge area. And all of the population, uh, the, the mass of the population is uh, on the Los Angeles County side, on the west, and you move out east, and there's desert, and there's farmland, and very sparse, sparse populations, and big health issues. Um, it's the 14th largest metropolitan area in the U.S. 
uh, there's been rapid economic, uh, rapid development of the region. So the 1950s, almost nobody lived out there. Fewer than a hundred, uh, fewer than a million people uh, lived out there. Uh, it became a place for cheap housing, as as the uh, Los Angeles and, and Orange County uh, sp sprawls happened. Real estate uh, became so very expensive, people could move out here by housing very cheap, and uh, that created all kinds of problems. One of the problems being there was no regulation for the housing. So you got, uh, and, and the regulation that exists is a hodgepodge of regulations that are different from township to township. Uh, and another is that people spend an inordinate amount of time on the freeways. It's not uncommon for people to spend two hours each way to and from work. As they travel to Los Angeles, downtown Los Angeles, or beyond, to Pasadena, uh, to Orange County, uh, and so forth. Uh, recently, well, starting uh, a few years ago, very high foreclosure rates, among the highest in the country. So we have a a lot of housing stock is empty now, decaying, and people without housing. People are living on gov government lands, on uh, uh, squatting. Uh, there's a problem even with people uh, squatting in housing that's empty uh, and, uh, because they have no place else to, to stay. Uh, the last point, uh, whoops. Uh, the major industry for Riverside County is warehousing and distribution centers. So with that comes diesel traffic, truck after truck after truck, the housing sprawl that develop right around and even into uh, the warehouses. So these children and their parents are breathing uh, diesel fumes. Uh, we were at USC and this is still going on. Our colleagues there in environmental health were doing studies of air quality in the state, and this is the area they concentrated on because the air quality is so very bad. Well, this is what happened with the economic recession. Uh, Inland Empire, which is red, um, before the recession was experiencing the greatest growth in GDP in California and among the highest in the U.S., well ahead of the U.S., well ahead of California. So you had this rapid development. Then you had the earliest impact in this region. So the GDP went into a decline in 2007 before it had in California and the rest of the country. Went deeper, the recession went deeper in this region and lasted longer in this region. So profound economic impact of what we've all experienced, all experienced uh, just more so. Uh, the major health issue right now, well, there are two. The, the major ones are obesity uh, and uh, still high rates of smoking. I'm going to concentrate on, on obesity today. About uh, two-thirds of the adult uh, population in San Bernardino County is overweight or obese. Forbes uh, called it the fourth fattest region in the country. Um, and uh, the health profile of the county uh, is uh, among the worst, if not the worst, in, in, the, in the state of California. The situation is very similar in Riverside County. Again, two-thirds overweight or obese, uh, and uh, well ahead of the rest of the state in heart disease rates, diabetes rates, cancer, and so forth. Well, challenges to the... To the uh, environment that we're facing as we undertake uh, this marriage between academic uh, research and public health, or population science, and, and the practice of public health, and uh, hopefully altering the health system. We've got this rapidly increasing population and traffic, talked about compromised air quality, the loss of open space, what has happened is what was recreational space is being lost to un uncontrolled uh, development and pollution. Uh, there are multiple jurisdictions, so it's very, very difficult to, to bring about uh, policy changes that are uh, consistent. And uh, the very fast growth uh, and slow response of government to, to that growth. 
Okay, now I'm going to concentrate on Riverside County because that's where we're doing our first project, and that's where we, our partner right now uh, in kicking this off is Riverside County. You remember the Institute I had four partners, one of which is the County of Riverside. San Bernardino is not at this point, uh, but uh, they're very interested in joining. There are other universities that are interested in joining. There are uh, <coughs> hospitals that want to join, but we wanted to start with uh, a manageable size initially. So we're concentrating right now on Riverside County. Just to show you where we're located, uh, the Claremont Graduate University School of Community and Global Health is in uh, Claremont. It's a lovely little village. Uh, you know Claremont. Does yeah. anybody else know Claremont? Yeah. It's like a, like a New England town. It's, it's, it's lovely. Um, no urban sprawl in Claremont. <laughs> but And UCR, University of California Riverside School of Medicine, uh, is located on the north side, east side of uh, Riverside. The county has given the, has given the institute facilities uh, with the with uh, their public health department new lovely building uh, overlooking uh, the mountains the San Gabriel uh, mountains so they have generously given us very nice space there and the Empire Health Par uh, Plan is very close by in Rancho Cucamonga so those are the and Harupa Valley it, we chose in part because it was close to us good place to start as we're underfunded and uh, they have special problems that I'll talk about. This is Harupa Valley and, and like I said it's it's in the northwest corner of Riverside County. To give you bearings this is Long Beach, Los Angeles, uh, Oceanside, San Diego. So that's where we are and Harupa Valley is about 40 roughly 40, 45,000 people <coughs> Um, it is an amalgamation of uh, actually nine different communities. I think we show seven or eight. We couldn't find one of them. Uh, couldn't define its boundaries exactly. They came together two years ago uh, to try to fight the urban sprawl problem and to bring about uh, some uh, uh, meaningful self-governance. So they came together and, cre and created this town of Harupa Valley. Uh, we're going to be concentrating our screening and uh, interventions in two areas, uh, Mira Loma, which is on the western side, and Rubido, which is on uh, the eastern side. You cross the river here, Santa Ana River, and uh, that's Riverside. Uh, this shows, uh, gives you some, something of the feel of uh, Harupa Valley. Uh, it sits out in the desert. Uh, it really is desert. Without irrigation, it's desert. But there's a beautiful view of the mountains behind. Uh, nobody knows the history of this dinosaur. No one knows where it came from. It appeared one day. <laughs> uh, and that's kind of the way Harupa Valley is. It, it, there's a part, there are parts of Harupa Valley where there's still hitching posts, and people ride their horses and hitch them to the hitching posts. Uh, this is the town hall. The, like a western town, right? Uh, and like I said, there's housing that is right up against the uh, diesel traffic. I mean, right? You don't see the warehouses, but they're all around here. And then there's much nicer ha housing, and then there's upscale housing in the hills. So huge um, variety of econom economic and social conditions uh, in, in this area. I'm going to talk briefly about the state of prevention science as I see it. Uh, and I think we're, we, we have things that can be translated. I don't think there's any question about it. We have things that can be translated now. There were the school-based uh, uh, prevention studies, the mass media studies, uh, the comprehensive community uh, heart disease uh, prevention studies, uh, and uh, substance abuse prevention studies in the community, uh, diabetes prevention studies, and more recently, e-health studies, all of which I think are ripe for translation. And, and so this is the stuff we're going to be working with. I just highlighted, I just prepared to bring your attention to some things that I've been involved with and, and uh, Dr. Flay here has been involved with uh, for a number of years. I think one of the first two published uh, uh, 
demonstrations of an effective school-based smoking prevention uh, program was in Minnesota. Um, and then uh, perhaps uh, the first uh, demonstration uh, of efficacy of a, copper, of a drug abuse prevention program, tobacco, alcohol, and other drugs, uh, was at USC. Something was, it was called Project SMART. Um, we did something uh, that, that took the basic elements of Project SMART and said, can we extend this to other outcomes like obesity and still have an effect? That was Project SHARP. And indeed, when we did that, we included uh, obesity uh, and, and uh, diet and exercise along with uh, tobacco and alcohol and drugs. We, we still got an effect on tobacco. Uh, we lost it, lost the effect for drugs, I guess I remember correctly, uh, we got an effect on body weight and, and we had a parent program along with that and got, got an effect of a significant reduction in cardiovascular risk with the parents. Brian developed something you, you all, I'm sure, have studied, the feeling fine without smoking, uh, which he uh, replicated, uh, replicated and then did one on, uh, on addressing alcohol. And uh, to me, in, in many ways, that was that was efficacy. I don't, we didn't talk. About, I mean, that was that was translational. We didn't talk about translation then. That wasn't a term. We didn't talk about transdisciplinarity either. Uh, those were not terms that were in the lexicon. But what happened was Brian and myself and Bill Hansen and other colleagues, uh, together with a television station and, and the head of a health news program. Uh, developed a program that resulted in widespread uh, dissemination. Schools signed up. Brian, do you remember how many? 47 schools that we included in the evaluation. 47 that we included in the evaluation, but there were there were hundreds all over the country because it was a syndicated series. So yeah, it was a real success. The ratings for uh, the television stations that participated jumped up uh, during during the weeks that this was broadcast. So. Uh, it, it was a huge success commercially, KBC thought, at any rate. Uh, and more recently, I've been doing some work uh, having, having to do with where programs are working. How come there are failures to replicate? Uh, uh, are there population characteristics, social environmental characteristics, and individual dispositional characteristics or phenotypes that predict? who will be responsive to a particular kind of intervention or not. So we've learned something about, and, and the, the quick answer is yes, those things matter. <laughs> and we've, we've done that in China, we've done it in Southern California, and we've got a consi pretty consistent replications. So there is, there is a, uh, an evidence base. <laughs> Some of these programs have been acknowledged by various groups that stamp and say these are evidence-based programs. And, uh, now, the, have you studied the North Karelia project? Do people teach that? Hmm. Well, let me suggest that, <laughs> that you start teaching that <laughs> and that you start learning that. In uh, the 1970s, the county of North Karelia, which is in eastern Finland, right on the Russian border, uh, the majority of the population are so-called ethnic Karelians who are dispersed across the, the border. So Karelia is like this. But Finnish Karelia is here. Actually, uh, Karelia goes down here too, but the county of North Karelia was identified in, in the Seven City Study, Ansel Keys and others, uh, as having the highest rate of cardiovascular mortality in the world. Far and away. Nobody was close. They were way out there in front of everybody. And um, Ansel Keys, who was a physiologist, thought he might have something to do with uh, the way people ate. Uh, and uh, so that was the, really the beginning of the epidemiology. I mean, that was very early, I think, cardiovascular epidemiology. Then in the 70s, the people in Finland, and especially in North Korea, became aware of this. And it was embarrassing. It was uh, tragic. Uh, so uh, there was actually a political upswell to do something about this. People were elected to parliament on the promise of doing something about this. So they started a quasi-experimental trial. 
comparing the North interventions that were done in, in the county of North Karelia with uh, inter, with lack of interventions, but similar measures in another county west of Karelia, and then eventually in, in the whole of Finland. So it was a quasi-experimental study, and basically this is what happened. Um, this uh, was North Karelia. When they started the program, there was already a little little decline. Uh, but over time, there has been an 85% reduction in cardiovascular mortality. They introduced the program to the rest of fin Finland uh, in 1978. Tremendous effect. It's been, it's had a lot of, a great deal of impact globally. Uh, numerous countries have tried to adopt a similar approach. Um, less impact, I would say, than in the U.S. Uh, simultaneous to the North Korea project, there was the uh, Stanford Five City uh, project, which you may be more familiar with. And uh, in five cities, some of which were assigned to a certain class of uh, community interventions, some to other kinds of interventions, some not to interventions, and they too got reductions in, in uh, risk factors. Uh, they did. Uh, they've never demonstrated, I don't believe, a reduction in cardiovascular mortality. In part because it hasn't been carried out yeah. long enough. In Minnesota, we tried to do something similar with substance abuse, tobacco, alcohol, and drug abuse. That is a comprehensive community approach. These were all approaches that involved schools, the medical system, in our case, law enforcement. Drug, illegal drug use is a, is a legal issue. Um, uh, community organizations and so forth. And we got some of the strongest and longest lasting effects, I think, um, to date. Now, in Riverside, we're undertaking this project based on the belief that it is possible to introduce uh, state of the science work in, in a community, have it take hold, and have it uh, sustained and realize, realize an effect if you give it enough time and you give it enough support. Ultimately, we want this to be a comprehensive community intervention in, in, in the uh, sense that the North Karelia Project and Stanford uh, Five City Studies and the Midwestern Prevention Project were, but that's not what we're doing right now. We're focusing on diabetes. That is the <coughs> epidemic we're facing in in Southern California and in much of the country. 26 million Americans have diabetes. Uh, mo almost all of it is, not all of it, but 90 to 95 percent is, is type 2 diabetes, which is preventable. How? How is it preventable? Type 2 diabetes? Better eating habits. Yeah. And type 2 diabetes does not happen in, in lean populations. It happens in overweight and obese populations only. That's why we have, it parallels perfectly the, the epidemic in obesity. Uh, 78 million Americans have uh, diabetes. The darker the red, the more the concentration of diabetes in the country. Um, over in Riverside County, uh, about 10% of our uh, population is, is diabetic. Um, but you see, for every one diabetic, it's estimated that there are three pre-diabetics. And you don't become diabetic, pre, you don't develop type 2 diabetes without first developing pre-diabetes. And that's detectable. Um, these are the diabetes rates uh, by ethnicity and, and uh, African Americans and Mexican Americans and uh, Indians and uh, Native Americans and uh, Native Alaskans are the people who experience it uh, disproportionately. Among the various ways of assessing diabetes, there's one method that can be done in population studies very easily, and that's hemoglobin, hemoglobin A1C measures. You can do it just with a finger prick. Uh, a value of 6.5% or greater uh, indicates diabetes. That's the one that we're using. Uh, for pre-diabetes, the value is considered between 5, 7, and 6.4. So if, you're, if you want to work with pre-diabetics and prevent them from becoming diabetics, 
you want to keep them from moving from this value to 6.5. So that is very simply what we're targeting, what we're trying to do. This is a three-year demonstration project and feasibility test. We want to pre prevent movement to, di to diabetic status. Uh, uh, and we want to do that by uh, encouraging uh, loss of body weight, uh, uh, a 7% or greater loss in, in body weight uh, from uh, dietary control and physical activity. The, um, specifically, or generally, the dietary uh, uh, recommendations that we're doing are uh, restricting calories uh, by changing what people eat, not putting people on diets, uh, reducing uh, uh, saturated fat intake uh, and high fiber diet. And, and although the ADA, uh, American Diabetes Association, doesn't make specific recommendations about glycemic index as it does for these other factors, uh, there's plenty of evidence we feel that you want to get people to uh, change the kind of carbohydrates that, that uh, they're, they're taking in. Uh, we're following. We're recommending the AD. We're following the ADA's recommendations for exercise. That is, 150 minutes or more moderate activity a week, uh, defined defined in heart rate, uh, and and or 75 minutes of high intensity activity. That's not their recommendation, although they they mention that as probably being equivalent or better than 150 minutes of moderate activity. Uh, the features of the interventions are that uh, the objectives are tailored to an individual. They're culturally tailored. They're tailored to there's an assessment of the, di of the family's uh, diet, the family's uh, cooking practices, uh, their activity patterns, and so forth. And, and the specific recommendations made are, are tailored to that. Uh, we're basically following the um, DPP, the Diabetes Prevention uh, Program, 16 weeks, uh, includes group sessions and, ind and individual counseling following the, the group sessions, 16 weeks. Um, we're doing something a little different that has been, that was done in the, the large uh, DPP trial. Uh, we're capturing existing social networks. That's me. That meant is you? Okay, um, and uh, we're doing that by going into elderly centers where people live together, and ha elderly housing for an elderly population, uh, and into um, preschool programs for a younger uh, adult population with children. So these are some of the general uh, uh, features of the program. We're assessing our primary concerns are with uh, body uh, mass reduction uh, measured by BMI and waist circumference and we're interested in especially the uh, fat component so we're doing bioelectrical impedance testing. Uh, other measures, uh, I mentioned uh, hemoglobin A1C, uh, we're doing blood pressure, we're doing um, uh, uh, spirometer testing for uh, expired uh, uh, vo volume of expired air to, to test uh, lung development because of the air pollution issue uh, these people face. And we're doing C-reactive protein, uh, which uh, I understand is, is uh, now believed to be related to the mechanisms for diabetes development. And that is inflammation related to, to the a diabetes development, as well as cardiovascular disease. Uh, and we're doing uh, measures of uh, health behaviors that are relevant. Our dietary measures are 24-hour recalls and food frequency questionnaires. Uh, physical activity assessments uh, include uh, job classification. The ones in red are the ones we're doing. Uh, mode of transportation, self-report, and we're using activity monitors or accelerometers uh, as a non-self-report uh, measure. 
there are two major programs, uh, very large-scale programs that we're designing the interventions after, the diabetes prevention program that was tested in 25 or 27 centers around the country uh, thousands, with thousands of people in the Finnish diabetes prevention program. The uh, DPP done in this country showed that with a 7% or greater reduction you want to leave time for questions? Yes, okay. With, with a 7% or greater uh, reduction in, in uh, body weight, you can reduce the transition from prediabetes status to diabetes by 58%. The Finnish study uh, similarly uh, showed that uh, by doing similar inter interventions, you could get a reduction in conversion to diabetes over a seven-year period. And the number of things that number of changes people made predicted uh, how uh, the risk reduction for them. Now it's going to be the project's going to be carried out over three years. It starts in Aruba Valley. It's going to expand to another uh, uh, city as well eventually. But we're going to do the program in a treatment elderly community, an elderly control community, a uh, family uh, program with younger adults and their children, uh, treatment and, and control. And these, uh, as I said, are the outcome targets. Okay. And over, over the next seven years, this is, this is the way things will play out within Riverside County and the inclusion of San Bernardino County. Well, what's at stake in these uh, this demonstration project. The policy decision makers in Riverside County are poised to make uh, to, to dedicate considerable resources to the program to shift their expenditures somewhat from <coughs> secondary tertiary care to primary prevention. Uh, and if we can demonstrate uh, that it is possible to carry out these interventions in communities and that people participate and we get some promising results. IEHP is, is poised to, to take a percentage. They fund by capitation. They give their providers, private and public providers, X numbers of dollars per patient, no matter what these people, no matter what the provider does with them to keep people well. <coughs> They're interested, if we can show positive effects, to shift some of that as much as 10% into community-based prevention. <laughs> so there's a lot, there's a great deal of, uh, at stake. Um, well, I'm not going to say a lot about how we are um, running out of time, but we do have five, re five teams that we're organizing uh, the activities around. Uh, a uh, uh, community assessment team that's assessing uh, features of the community uh, that we need to understand in order to do uh, meaningful and appropriate uh, interventions. Population assessment team that's developing the measures and choosing them. Program development team that I head that is choosing uh, programs that we're going, to, going to, to, to use. We also have a hospital outreach team. Hospitals in California are required to uh, devote part of their resources to community uh, action, and they don't know what to do with the money. We're going to help them. Uh, and then we have a group of uh, health administrators and economists who are going to be trying to make uh, economic sense out of the thing. Are we are we producing an effect? And of course, all of those relate to uh, one another. <laughs> Finally, I, I won't t I won't talk about this, but I'll just I'll show you each of the uh, participating organizations is making a <laughs> substantial investment. CGU is they cover my salary. Um, I use my seminars as experiential experiential teaching opportunities. Students, I have two seminars that I run, one PhD and one MPH, and students go into the field to work on the project. One week is we do a seminar session, the next week is a workshop session. So it's tied directly uh, into the project. Um, uh, they will, CGU is giving us faculty appointments for people we bring in. CGU benefits in that, that uh, this faculty person that uh, Riverside uh, is supporting is uh, going to be totally supported through the institute 
but will be a CGU faculty member. IEHP, uh, they're the ones with the big money. They really have the money because they provide health care coverage for the poor people of the county. And uh, if they give as much as 6 or 8 or 10 percent uh, to prevention, uh, there's a lot at stake there. Um, and UCR, similarly, uh, is providing uh, substantial support. So ultimately, we see CTRI as at the center of this web that involves two counties, at least it's, it's to be a regional institute, uh, and involve the various segments of uh, the health system and the greater community uh, in a collaborative way. Um, and then finally, in regards to obesity, this, this is important. <laughs> <laughs>